Hello everybody, my name is Michael Dunn. I'm an Associate Professor at the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. We'll continue our uh, clips on the topic of moral distress and in this fourth and final clip I'll be going through some of the practical strategies that healthcare systems and providers and caregivers can put in place to manage and mitigate the effects, negative as they are, of moral distress. I'll review the main causes of moral distress briefly and then talk about what some of the uh, solutions to that problem might be. So, addressing moral distress, where should we target our attention? So, I think the first thing we might ask, going again back to the Morley and colleagues framework for defining moral distress, is to look first at the moral events themselves. Can we reduce the number of moral events that give rise to moral distress? Well, some I think can be mitigated. We can potentially reduce the kind of moral, the number of moral events that people experience. But in truth, moral events are an endemic and almost natural feature of good care in a healthcare system. At least some of them are. Now, it has been argued by some that actually the negative impact of uh, of some of these moral events isn't as negative as it might, it might first appear. Particularly this discussion goes in relationship to uh, moral dilemmas, where some argue that a little bit of distress when you're faced with a dilemma is actually a productive and good thing. It's important that people reflect and are troubled by these hard ethical trade-offs they have to make between competing values. So the hard decisions that keep us up at night as healthcare professionals it's not necessarily a bad thing to have one sleep disturbed, you might say, because of that kind of constant requirement to review, think through and reevaluate the decisions that you made. Well, yes, I think that's true in part, but if it starts to become distressing and distressful in terms of your experiences of constantly reviewing and revisiting those decisions, that's not a productive or good thing. So I think evaluating, considering, reflecting on your our, our hard, our hard cases, our hard decisions is a good thing, but if it gives rise to psychological distress, we should be mitigating the impact of that, um, th that particular event. Can we reduce the uh, psychological distress that results from, moral dis the results from the moral events we've been describing? Well, yes, I think we can. There are well-established ways of tackling distress in, in healthcare professional roles. And of course, psychological support is widely available. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. So I think we can target the distress itself and see how that can be mitigated. And finally, can we break the direct causal relationship between moral events and psychological distress? Again, I think that is possible. With the right kinds of supports in the moral events themselves, I think it's quite possible that while those moral events will continue, we will have supportive infrastructures in place that will prevent those events giving rise to the distress. So what kind of support measures can we use to break that relationship between a moral event and the experience of psychological distress? And I'll say more about that too. Okay, let's look at the mitigations of different levels of intervention. I'll start by thinking about institutional change. What ways may institutions change to mitigate some of the moral events we've been describing at, at least where they have a, an institutional cause to them. Now, I think one thing we might immediately say is that we need to have responsive institutions. We have to have institutions that can both recognise moral, moral distress taking place and are willing, able and desiring to bring about change that reduces that moral distress. So there has to be an ethical awareness of moral events, there has to be an awareness and concern about staff experiences, of course, and a willingness and desire and funding to take active steps to address those. We've got to be a bit careful, I think, when we talk about practical strategies here to avoid ideal scenarios. We can't redesign perfect healthcare systems, although that may solve our problem if we could. We've got to think about what's, what's pragmatic, what's possible in the systems we already work within and, and experience care inside. So what are these realistic mitigations that a system could, could put in place? Well, one of these changes might be a, a kind of basic way in which the health system functions and communicates within its own parameters. 
We might be worried about the hierarchical nature of managerial practice or decision-making process. Perhaps it's a hierarchical approach to caregiving that is exclusionary rather than inclusionary. That is to say that it doesn't give everybody in the system the chance to have input into decisions or into the day-to-day -day function of the system. And so a wider use of engagement and consultation with lower level healthcare staff and, uh, and the, 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 the wide gamut of health prof professionals in that system could help to mitigate some of the epistemic injustice concerns or the et ethical climate problems, which again, the managers might not have a good sense of on uh, sitting in their offices versus those on the ground. So the idea of the listening healthcare system is sometimes put in place as a notion in which the way in which the institution might, might, might tackle moral distress that emerges amongst its members. I think also transparency is important. As a second point here, not only are we inclusive in who gets a voice in the decision-making process, but justifications for decisions that might not be imperfect or that require certain ethical uh, considerations to be put to one side we can justify those clearly and we can be quite transparent in documenting why those decisions have been made. That can often, I think, address some of the concerns about ethical climate that people have and give rise to their distress. We might also think that one way of helping people to break the link between the moral event and the psychological distress is better preparation for those moral events, ethical preparedness, if you like, in day-to-day in, in -day practice. And there is an important role here, I think, for ethics education, both in school, but also in continuing professional development settings, to, to equip people with the tools, resources, and resilience to tackle moral dilemmas, to deal with moral uncertainty, and to have the confidence to act on their moral agency. Interventions to pre-identify moral distress, I think, could also be led by the institution, especially in high-risk areas and in training settings where we commonly see problems arising. So is there an early warning system for distress? How do we work with the, with the ground level of practice to try to put those early warning systems in place within a team or ward-based environment? And finally, I think a lot of this is about communication, as I mentioned right at the start, not just in terms of the way the system makes decisions, but just in day-to-day -day communicative practices between different members of the team. Are managers and staff able to communicate together? Are there direct channels of communication between them? Does that enable people in practice to share the problems that they're identifying with managers? And do the managers in turn hear and respond appropriately and correctly in communication? with the people practicing healthcare on the ground. So turning now to care practice level mitigation, this is in a sense the middle level of, of mitigation. We, can, we look at the ways in which practice has endorsed a certain type, sets of tools or support infrastructure to support people to address the impact of moral events and particularly high stakes decisions that can be very distressing for people. One option is to rely on these supportive interventions around ethical matters more generally, and particularly to give a more central and more dominant role to the ethics committee, perhaps, either to make a decision on behalf of the team, or more commonly, to provide advice and a supportive function to that team in addressing a moral dilemma or moral uncertainty that's being experienced. Over time, in a particular healthcare practice in relation to particular decisions like resource allocation or during COVID, it's quite possible that algorithms could be produced and relied upon to essentially decenter and depersonalize the moral event, to hand it over to a tool that could almost delegate the authority to, to the algorithm and those who were, who, who were responsible for constructing it. If it's a good algorithm, we can be confident that the decision is a sound one and we can, in a sense, defer the responsibility in that way and potentially experience less distress, I think, accordingly. I think at the ground level of, of, of care practice, there are also important inclusive and supportive decision-making practices that should be endorsed in a multidisciplinary way on a ward or in any, any particular specialty context. I think, there's a, as I said before, a good argument for adopting a whole team approach to addressing constraints and ethical challenges, not to leave individual practitioners on their own 
to sort out all these problems or to live in fear or worry or paralysis in addressing those. So a, a culture that builds the sharing of difficulty seems really important here, I think. Uh, in the United States, a common uh, strategy that is offered sometimes by ethics committees is the so-called moral distress debriefing service. That is to say, when a team has faced a particularly high profile decision and is struggling either to decide what to do or to come to terms with the decision that they've made, they might seek out a debrief from either an ethicist involved uh, in, in that setting or potentially a committee of experts, including psychologists and ethicists, just as a way of essentially allowing them to, to, to break the, the chain between the distress and that experience of, of making a moral decision. So I think the idea of a debriefing activity could be quite uh, valuable here. And finally, from the care practice level, investment in day-to-day -day emotional support measures. So some of these can come from the institution, they can be funded by the institution, put in place across the system, but there may well need to also be local practices that are in place on a particular ward, given the kinds of challenges that, that people in that ward face. They're going to be quite different in ICU versus psychiatry versus um, occupational therapy, for example. So there needs to be an attenuation of the emotional support structures to the particular specialty context and the types of moral events that commonly arise within those contexts. Again, I think good practice around communication within a team at the local level is also very important. Feeling confident or willing to share confidential information, to share difficult stories, to share narratives of, of, of uncertainty and including personal uncertainty is good practice and should be something that should be um, st st uh, so people should strive to, to, to put in place wherever possible. And finally, at the mitigation level for the individual staff, and what might be done for the individual staff to deal with the kinds of distress that they're experiencing, I think there are a, a, a range of similar points to make. One is to make sure that they are able to access and are encouraged to access personal well-being support. That might mean health interventions themselves, if the psychological distress is particularly bad, problematic, perhaps it's led to a mental disorder, or it could just be low-level support to enable them to have someone to, to talk to. And I think pre-identifying those at heightened risk of, of, of concern is also a very important part of that supportive network um, for the individual. There may also be implications for their particular ability to practice their, their role in that setting. Um, this is certainly something that came out of work uh, that's been done with nurses during COVID-19. Some learned that the, 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 the job as they were practicing it wasn't for them. They would be much better placed in a different part of the hospital, for example. So I think it's important to recognise for staff to be encouraged to, to think and reflect on what kind of role they want, what kind of challenges are best addressed for them, and to tailor their job responsibilities and be encouraged and allowed to do so in accordance with, where, with strategies that might mitigate their experiences of moral distress potentially. And finally, again, to, to make the same point uh, at, the local, at the level of the individual, um, an expansion of, of uh, counselling and mentoring, I think, could be an important part of any strategy on the ground to alleviate moral distress. That could be possible both in educational settings or continuing professional development settings where mentoring is increasingly important, but it can also be part of day-to-day -day practice where there is a, a specialist, uh, essentially, process in place to allow people to have access to counselling and, 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 and mentoring uh, in order to deal with explicit instances of the moral distress that they've experienced. So, to conclude, this is what I hope you've taken from the module as a whole. The concept of moral distress, I think, is well known, well recognised as being a problem across all healthcare settings. But despite the common usage of the term moral distress, there is a lot of conceptual uncertainty, both in the academic literature, but also on the ground, I think, about what we actually mean by moral distress. And I suggested that there are narrow and broader accounts of moral distress and that by and large, I myself would defend a broader account of moral distress. Partly that's because I think it's best described how it's used across healthcare settings, but also I think the broader accounts meet the requirements for the necessary and sufficient conditions of that concept. Moral distress is a commonly occurring phenomenon. It will happen to you and others in healthcare settings all the time. We will all know people who are experienced or are experiencing 
moral distress. But it can differ in levels of severity, it can affect some people more than others, and it can be triggered by particular kinds of uh, circumstances or scenarios. So we should be aware of the patterns of moral distress that we have seen in some of the literature I described. Fourthly, it will be ever-present. We cannot get rid of entirely of the moral events that trigger distress. We can reduce or address some of those uh, moral events through mitigation, and we can also break the link between the moral event and the psychological distress experienced, but we'll never be able to fully address moral distress in the round. However, given that the detrimental impact of moral distress is so widely recognised now, and it can be seriously negative both for the person involved and for the system of care, we should be attentive to imaginative ways of mitigating it. And I suggest that uh, that mitigation could happen at the institutional, the ward-based or care practice level, but also at the individual staff level. And there are good reasons to, to, to make those changes uh, when we can. Thanks very much.